some of these controversies that have arisen in telling the history of something because this in some measure is what happens with these pictures is that this is one aspect of a history of parchment that you don't necessarily see in some of the history books and there haven't been a lot done on that particularly before 1940. And uh, I'm having a little bit of a hard time trying to convince a book publisher that, hey, you know, there's just not a whole lot of history on parchment up to a certain point because nobody wanted anybody to know anything. Now, that, that's been my experience, but I want to talk about some others. <coughs> to commemorate the anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Smithsonian Institute was going to prepare an exhibition a number of years ago to commemorate that anniversary. And there was a preview of it ahead of time. Now, if you're saying, well, I never heard about that, it never made it public because some veterans groups and others saw what the ones who imagined that exhibition did with it, and it turned out into this thing of the United States as the ultimate aggressor uh, at Pearl Harbor and how we were the real enemy there. Now, you think how that squares or doesn't square with those John Wayne movies that you saw at the time of Pearl Harbor. Well, there was such a controversy over that that it never opened. It never opened because of the way that history had been changed, or at least the perception of it. Now, sometimes this is amusing to me, and it happened. They were doing a, one of these commemorative theme park probably isn't the right word to use, but I can't remember what it was, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And advocates for the disabled wanted a statue of FDR to be done with FDR in a wheelchair. Now, there are virtually no photographs of FDR available either on crutches or in a wheelchair. He did not want himself portrayed that way. And I honestly can't tell you how that part of that battle <coughs> sorted itself out. The funny aspect of it to me was what happened with Eleanor Roosevelt. She loved to wear fur you very few pictures you see her that she has on some kind of a fur piece. A lot of times, and of course they were popular then, those whole animals that go around and bite themselves that you wear with a suit. I actually I thought about you should have gotten that out of your archives. I have one of those. Got it in a used clothing store in Worcester, Massachusetts. Well, the animal rights people were just outraged at those pictures of Eleanor Roosevelt in the fur, and they didn't want any of them displayed. And it was virtually impossible to do anything about so many of the photographs. I think that appeals to my sick sense of humor, to think about that aspect of it. But. I've consulted, haven't consulted over the last year of doing some research on parchment. I consulted with two of the more notable history books on parchment, and if any of you are interested in this and pursuing it, I do have copies of them over there. You can grab them from Amazon for not too much money. Get on that used book section, and sometimes you'll pay more for the shipping 
then you do the book. I've done that so many times I've lost count. But that is one aspect of Parchman's history, of what you can piece together through some actual histories of Parchman. But then, maybe this is one of these hidden sorts of history that gives us another view of what Parchman was like in the 1930s. Alice Stewart became the head nurse at Parchman in 1930. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to tell that Theodore G. Bilbo ultimately appointed her. Now, we never have figured out because you know perfectly well that those jobs as civilian employees with Parchman, so much of the time they were political, that you had to have some kind of political connection to get them. We can't figure out where Aunt Alice had a political connection. She was not. She, Aunt Alice was born in 1898, and she went to Parchman in 1930. So, you know, by those standards, she was fairly young. She got her nursing degree in 1925 from Gartley Ramsey Hospital in Memphis and went to work for uh, VA, at the VA hospital in Memphis, and then she worked several years at a VA hospital in Outwood, Kentucky, and came back to Memphis and subsequently and worked at the VA hospital there and taught at Gartley Ramsey some and subsequently got the job at Parchman, which she was there until 1938 and she got swept up like others do when another governor was elected. She had managed to find favor with three governors. Uh, somebody suggested one time when they first saw these pictures that uh, Aunt Alice was not unattractive, and that Theodore G. Bilbo had a reputation for enjoying the ladies. And I thought, uh-huh, I can see that with that. You only have to know Aunt Alice to know that that wasn't the issue. But with the Alice Stewart collection, I have to thank my cousin Brian King for doing this. Uh, I grew up with these photographs. A uh, number of them you see around the room. And then what is slide going through on the slides are the chapters that in this book that Cousin and I are putting together on parchment in the order in the books that they are. We have a chapter on the history of parchment the farm work at Parchman because Parchman was designed from its beginning to be self-supporting. To They were supposed to, sort, to support themselves with virtually no money from the state. And they did pretty well for a while. I think it's interesting. You know, this is one of these interesting side notes that comes up. Uh, Parchman was basically started in 1901, so Aunt Alice and Parchman semi grew up together. By 1905, Parchman was making a profit, and a pretty big profit. And they produced their own food, they had the agricultural interests, they obviously grew cotton, uh, soybeans, corn, they had cattle, and they did supply the general public with some of the produce that they had. It was interesting, you, you know how history manages to repeat itself. I saw an article not too long ago uh, about some greenhouses at Parchman that had not been used for 15 years, and they had refurbished them, and at the end of May, they were going to produce something like 80,000 pounds of tomatoes from those greenhouses. And I mean, this is this year. So in some ways, you have to say, well, you know, farming is not what it used to be and they're not going to make the same amount of money with cotton. I think some of you probably remember the day when, they, when Parchman uh, rebound 
textbooks, uh, high school textbooks, and we even have some uh, song books in our church that were rebound at Parchment. I had, I never knew exactly what was going on there, but I had the real sense that um, Aunt Alice still had some connections there that she was able to get those song books down there uh, to see to getting them done. Uh, we might still be able to find some of those around the church somewhere. But what happens with these pictures is that, and the, I think one of the problems I've run into, for one thing, doing a book like this one that's a picture book, coffee table book, if you want to call it that, I found out that for me it's a whole lot easier to write an academic paper and do that research on Perry Mason than it is to write captions for photographs. Now, Lynn West has experience doing that. Uh, that's not in my wheelhouse quite as much. And that's been harder than writing the introduction to the thing. Go figure. It's a matter of practice, I think. But you see all of these pictures that obviously most of them are staged. Now, there's, we do not know who took these photographs that you see around here. Some of those are ones that uh, Jill found elsewhere. There's some other pictures on the Mississippi archives that obviously were made same vintage by the same photographer. Can't figure out when. Uh, I studied very carefully some of these pictures and on, in one or two pictures found a calendar in the background that these were taken in 1933. That was before the WPA artist project where people took photographs. They didn't start that until 1938. So the archives in Mississippi, of course, my cousin Catherine and I are prejudiced. We think our pictures are better than the ones they have at the archives. <laughs> These pictures are really and truly treasures because they're the only pictures that I have ever seen or that anybody has ever seen with pictures of the infirmary. And that gives them a value there. Now, unfortunately, I can't find out. There's one little tidbit, and if anybody knows any folklore about this, let me know. I'm trying to track down something on what they've done there. But what I run into is looking at these pictures too much through the sieve of Aunt Alice. Now, Aunt Alice was, as some of you have known along the way, Aunt Alice was tough. I mean, she, uh, but she had a heart there. One of the most moving things that I found when start there, okay, there were these pictures, and then I'm in the old Stuart home place, and I started digging through an old quilt box that's up there, and I found little things like Aunt Alice's diploma from graduate school, and some things like that, and then all of these letters, uh, and one of them was from someone who had obviously been at the prison and had gotten out and wrote Aunt Sarah, Aunt Alice, a letter later. And there was one line in there that just hit me in the face when it said, you were nice to me when you did not have to be. And he was writing that letter to express his appreciation to Aunt Alice for kindness as she had extended to him in some ways. And when you put this beside a letter that one of the doctors wrote to Governor about getting her her job at, from various times, I guess it was this letter she had either written to uh, uh, Mike Connor or Hugh White that said she's been here 
X amount of time and knows how to handle the prisoners. And all I wanted to say was, oh, if only he knew <laughs> that, that she, <laughs> she could take care of herself. Uh, but you get to the history book and you find a lot of conflicting statements. And I guess this is true with history, take it all in all. None of them really talk about the infirmary that much. Uh, you hear more about the brutality, and I was glad that Jill had the music to play. Uh, there's a connection here that in 1933, I don't know why so much happened at Parchman that year, but John and, Al and his son, Alan Lomax, were asked by the Library of Congress to collect folk music in the South. And they were the first ones to collect folk music from Parchman. And a lot of people have made that as the focus of the history. Well, that doesn't tell the whole story, as we might well imagine. Uh, if you're interested in the music that they collected, you can get on the Library of Congress website and look it up. And what they collected is there. You, I think you can even listen to some of it. And then Alan Lomax, is probably better known than his father, made several trips back to Parchman, including 1950, and collected some of the blues music. You also and this is in addition, I'll just mention the farming interest. We know enough about farming to imagine what kind of growing they did there. There's some interesting pictures in here of when uh, some locusts moved through and destroyed the crops and to see the devastation that that caused was just absolutely made. This is during the Depression. They're strapped for money anyway. And what's that going to do when you lose virtually all of your crop? You know, I don't know if you have to have a farmer's heart or something like that to really identify <coughs> with what's going on there and to think about the full ramification of what destroying all of your crops about for that whole year, what that's going to do to your maintenance of uh, that. One of the interesting things about the farm pictures, though, is that you can see Parchman in transition, that they have some of the newer equipment coming in, but you also see the mules plowing and, dr and pulling some of that equipment. I think it's pretty interesting. They had a road grader that was pulled by mules. And so, you know, it was one year in the history of Parchman that they went to Texas. Now, this had bought 700, went to Fort Worth and got 750 mules. And this, now, that's one trouble I've run into in this collection is that trying to do these captions of having 12 or 13 pictures of mules. And they're virtually all alike. And what do you say about 13 pictures of mules? If I had to read too much into the story, since there's some obvious, some people in the good soup club in there milling around, I have a feeling they were selling off some of those mules because of finances. Now, I'm just guessing on that. That's how you make up history. This is where it gets messed up, is that you have somebody making up too much. But that's fun. That, that is fun. But you have, and I think, well, you have several hog killings, too. But <laughs> one of the interesting things, and you can see this, is in this hospital picture, and that's Aunt Alice, administering anesthetic and I don't know if there's a like I said I think these pictures are staged and there's this well I can 
tell by that expression on Aunt Alice's face, I don't think she's happy that they're in there taking pictures, that she wants them to get that picture taken and get out so they can go ahead with the medical procedure. Now, like I said, I'm assuming that there's a person on the operating table. The woman in street clothes, now you think from a cleanliness standpoint, this wouldn't happen now. But the woman standing there, she's also in a hog killing picture. <laughs> she, well, what else? That's what we call that here is hog killings. I think I had to get that phrase out of the caption that I had. But, but she was the president of the Mississippi Board of Prisons. In 1920, you know, of course, Southerners are so far behind the times. <laughs> Women didn't get to do anything. Her, she had, her husband in the 1920s was the president of the Board of Prisons. He died in office, and what is the typical thing we still do in the South? The, the wife took the place. Well. She took the place until 1920, about 1936. Now, you get a mixed bag with her. On the one hand, her husband was very much in that good old boy club of probably doing pretty well because of the prison system that they had. Uh, just uh, incidentally, the, the prison was set up the way it was to replicate an antebellum plantation. Now, the superintendent's home by this time may have been the ornate Victorian, but it was set up like a pre-Civil War plantation. And this is where a lot of the perception of the prisoners as slaves come in that they wanted to. And you've got some smoking guns around there. This is when Mississippi had done the Constitution. This is when the Jim Crow laws were passed. And so it was something of a perfect storm. And book, if you haven't read it and you're interested in Southern, interested in Southern politics, it's one called The Revolt of the Rednecks. Uh, Kerwin wrote that, Revolt of the Rednecks, and it studies Mississippi politics, particularly the governors from about 19, oh, maybe the 1870s to 1930. So just about all of the governors who were involved in setting up Parchman and running it in those early days were the very people that Kerwin discusses in Revolt of the Rednecks. It's a fascinating book. Uh, makes you think though and we don't some of that thinking we don't like to do besides farming at Parchman there was also a sawmill they milled all the lumber they had there they also had a brick making enterprise and not only did they make these all of the buildings on the grounds were built by prisoners it's interesting to look at the evolution of the camps in there uh, they had a whole camp of prisoners set up who were gifted in <coughs> building and woodwork. They had their own separate camp. And you see a lot of different architectural styles coming out in these various camps for, they were called the cages, for prisoners. They began having probably by the 1930s, and even though there's still some wooden edifices still there, by the 1930s, virtually all of the buildings were brick. Now they sold these bricks to the general public. There's one really good picture of the archives on there where they had taken a lot of produce, and there's the governor of Arkansas standing there in front of a, <laughs> did you see that one? <laughs> Dennis, did you notice it did not say who the governor was? And I, 
But that was some of the things. They did obviously have to have some medical care on there, and there's a story that Catherine told me about that I haven't been able to track down anywhere, is that in midstream of an operation, doctors wanted to stop an operation uh, and just let the person die. Aunt Alice wouldn't let them. She dug her heels in and said, no, you're not either. And the man lived to tell about it, and there was a newspaper story on that. Now, that's not in any of the histories. What is, though, for at least two times before the 1940s, they had, and this is a controversial notion, they used prisoners for medical research. One of them was done with nutrition and pellagra in about 1915. And you'd get a group of prisoners and use them as your test subjects, usually with the payoff that they would be pardoned and released. Well, they did say for all you could say about the cruelties of parchment, they ate better than probably any prisoners in the United States because you just think about it. What all they were growing on those farms, all that food that they had, I thought it was funny in one of the uh, pictures of each camp had its own dining room, and I think one of them is so hilarious because it, this was something that wasn't in my home. I'm just saying, you know, you'd always have, when you're going to have your greens and what have you, there'd be that, that bottle of, of hot sauce or peppers. There's one sitting on the table there, which I think is, I said, mm-hmm. And you have pictures that you don't have as much of the produce, but they ha they ate better. So when this doctor was going to do those experiments, he had to cut back on their diet from the fresh produce and the fruits. They had orchards on the parchment grounds, and I think they had some pecan trees too because the Sunflower County, I've since learned, is evidently just really the best place in the state to grow pecans, that pecans are fussy. And you have to have the right soil and the right temperature, and the delta seems to have it. And I'm pretty sure there's some pecan trees that you see scattered along. But they had the fresh fruits and vegetables. They had milk. They had a balanced diet. And those prisoners just didn't want to go on with it because they didn't like the diet. <laughs> One thing I haven't been able to track down, and I'm trying to, in 1933, they did some research on encephalitis. And there's one mention in one sentence in one history about that. And tracking that down is, may be a challenge. Uh, the New Orleans Times Picayune Sunday type magazine has something on that. Uh, Jill's given me some opportunities that I want to explore uh, about how, they, but that is, you know, you start thinking about how limited, now most of the history books talk about how poor the medical care was at the time. You think about, this is the day before antibiotics. Now, you just take antibiotics out of the equation, and you've got serious problems for some things that you're likely to see in the set. And see there, you can see those peppers there sitting on that table. One of those had a piano in it. Uh, David Collins asked if I remembered when we went when we were seniors in high school, that we took a day trip to Parchman. <laughs> yeah, we did. Got to see the they fed us a meal and the, and the uh, band played. 
But I want to talk a little bit about something that happens with parchment history that is really interesting. Perhaps this may interest me more than anything else is when you put it in the realm of popular culture. Uh, Jill admitted that she uh, got the title for this exhibition from the Faulkner phrase of destru uh, destruction doom. Destination Doom, when old Mink Snopes got sent down in the mansion, in the novel The Mansion, for murder. He got sent to Parchment, and he was not pleased with that. One of the more interesting things, though, and you see this picture, <laughs> began as a newspaper article on this convict by the name of Pap Tabor, and he's He was convicted of murder in about 1916, and he hit the 1930s, and he wasn't able to work on the farm anymore, so two governors pardoned him. He wouldn't go. <laughs> he, he would not go. And William Faulkner picked up on probably a newspaper article. Did you have that in the, the newspaper article back in that? William Faulkner obviously picked up on this and used Pap Tabor as the model for the tall convict in Wild Palms. It, they sent prisoners in 1927 to do flood relief in the Delta, and the tall convict wasn't going to run away because he started looking at all that he was seeing outside and said, got three meals a day and a place to stay. Now, Pap Tabor gets in a little bit different situation. He had an apartment in the infirmary. And I, when we were looking at these things as kids, all we ever looked at was a newspaper article and thought it was funny. When I looked at these photographs again after goodness knows how many years, I was just amazed at the number of Pap Tabor images that they have in here, like the birthday party that they threw for him when he turned 94. <laughs> and you, his family and friends came and it's just, he went fishing every day. He had a valet. He wore, I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating. There are at least seven or eight photographs. He's almost a, you know, just a pop culture figure that for whatever reason, I find that connection more interesting to me than the, uh, blues music. Now don't throw anything at me. We all have different tastes, but I'm just absolutely fascinated by these Pap Tabor images because that puts some kind of an interesting human side of history that you're not going to find anywhere. You're just not going to find anywhere else. Also in the 1930s, and it was not just then, but they did folk art art. And Jill, uh, sounds like something that would happen in my office, that's walking cane or stick, whichever, that's a, you think that's a cane or a stick? You know, there's a subtle difference in a walking cane and a walking stick. And I think the cane is the one you use when you have to, and the stick is more for decoration. <laughs> So you can make a decision about which one that is. But, and I told Jill, I said, oh, by the way, I have an article from the Mississippi Folklore Journal from a number of years ago on the folk art that prisoners produced, particularly in the 1930s. And uh, that's another, I don't suspect that is going to go to anybody's other collection other than Cousin's House and that is there are three alligators that Brian King has, a mother and two babies. Didn't you, it's mother and two babies? And uh, we're tacky 
we look at our pictures and say, well, our pictures are better than other people's. Uh, if you embark on writing a history, don't expect it to be easy. And I think the nature of history has, you start thinking of the levels, you can get what people have written down. And I think in some ways we hold that as a very sacred sort of history. You also have oral history. And I think the big regret that I have to look back on this is Aunt Alice isn't around anymore to ask her to explain some of these pictures and some of the stories behind them. Uh, have been able to patch together some things from folk knowledge, shall we say, and common knowledge. Uh, for instance, I think it's interested in one of the pictures, and it flashes up on here, of uh, Pap Tabor. He's, he's sitting in his apartment in the infirmary reading the commercial appeal. <laughs> and a lot of us have to sit there and say, we grew up on the commercial appeal in northeast Mississippi. And But the other thing that is behind that is the Delta Democrat Times, which Hodding Carter Jr. edited at the time, just absolutely would denounce Parchman and what was going on there on a regular basis. And they absolutely could not stand Harding, Harding Carter. So I went and I said, mm-hmm. On the one level, you know why they were reading the commercial appeal. That's what anybody above Jackson read. But I said, then on the other hand, is that the only paper that they had in North Sunflower County? Now, I say that as somewhat, of, but that is typical that he's sitting up there reading the paper. That's a wonderful way to start the day. Uh, but then you have photographs, and I think one of the things that we tend to do, and maybe this is a side blessing of shows like the Antique Road Show, this has made us more aware of places that we can find history and the way we can piece together things. Now, I always get afraid to do this, but I'm willing to entertain any questions that anybody might have. I have a question about Aunt Alice. Oh! <laughs> when she left there, she left the Sunflower County Library I guess she came back, well, she came back here in like 1940. And Catherine says that she was, I don't know if it was immediate, but she was Dr. Shan's nurse for a while. And then I don't know when she started working at the shirt factory. It was probably in the 1950s, early, while I was still in school. And that was and and until she retired. So she did not do what you would call the typical nurse's career of working in a hospital. She was more of the industrial sort of nurse. That's obviously what you'd call that working at shirt factory. But you know, I want, I've wondered too, beyond the political considerations, if the fact that she had spent most of her career in the mm -hmm. VA hospital is what made her an attractive candidate for working at Parchman, because we know perfectly well that the majority of the population at those VA hospitals would have been men, as it was at Parchman. Here are two of the books you might look at that they, in some ways, they make you mad at times, I think, but you have to, you just about have to get over that. But there's Down on Parchment Farm, which, by the way, this was the 
superintendent's home rather opulent uh, and this the other one is worse than slavery parchment farm and the ordeal of Jim Crow justice both of these were done in the late 70s they're good books one of them does more with the blues music the other one does more within the, with the racial aspects of the prison and those sorts of things and both of them have been very helpful uh, the sort of volume that we're do that hopefully will one of these days come out on Parchment Farm is from this same company that will look something like this. It's one on Sing Sing Prison. And then there's one on the Tennessee State Penitentiary. And then, uh, now, Catherine and I were in San Francisco a little less than a month ago. And we did not go to Parchman, but we went to the, I mean to Alcatraz, but we went to the Alcatraz gift shop. <laughs> and they have an Alcatraz volume. So we can add uh, Parchman, and that's the cover photo of that. You can add Parchman to this, and this is Pap Tabor over here beside, these are all sweet potatoes. That he did not. Well, no, he has on a suit and he's smoking a pipe. <laughs> I don't. I was. I was supposed to have heard from. This makes me nervous when this happens. I was supposed to have heard from our editorial assistant last Friday, and I haven't yet. So. Uh, I'm not from this city, and I. Okay, do you know where Indianola is? No. Okay. Well, it's in Sunflower County, which is in the Dell. It's if you go to Highway 82. U.S. Highway 82, and you take 49 West in Indianola, you'll go right past it. And it's kind of in, I'd say, you've got Clarksdale up here. It's a little southeast of Clarksdale. If somebody, some of you Delta people, maybe. <laughs> that clears it right up. That just clears it right up. It's a good piece. Uh, it's a good piece as well. I'm trying to think of my mileage on here. 110 miles. That. Well, I go through there, but I go through on the southern part of the county. I go through Indianola when I'm every two weeks. What's the name of the book that Sharon had yet? Parchment Farm. The Mississippi State Penitentiary. How did it end up in this picture up here fitting into the parchment? I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Now, this is one of these areas where Mississippi has, for good or ill, been on the forefront of prison reform. Mississippi was the first penitentiary to have conjugal visits. They decided, well, they even early in the days, and I apologize for the indelicacies of this, bust in prostitutes because they thought it would help keep the prisoners calmer. And then they started letting their wives come, but the women could not have conjugal visits because. <laughs> um, the very issue that you see here, but obviously there was some conjugal type this. <laughs> and you don't know if this, when she got there, if she was pregnant when she got there, or if this was one of the inmates, or one of the one of the civilian workers. That, 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 that what? Not that I know of. Because that was one thing that, and this is what I wonder if some of those things would. I know the name of 
the head doctor there, and it was, his name was Biles, B-I-L-E-S. What about, what happens uh, when a prisoner dies? They have a cemetery. They have three. They have three cemeteries. By the way, don't look up on find a grave because it's not going to help you. I'm just telling you. They had three cemeteries at Parchment, and if no one claimed the body of one of the prisoners, they would be there, or they could record, be buried there in one of the cemeteries. Well, I saw the image of the funeral. Is, do you have any idea what that was, or who it was? Because mm -hmm. there were flowers, and I thought, well, well see, I think I read somewhere that you had a cemetery that was basically reserved for civilian workers because see some of them that was their home that they you see some of those ha different houses on there that people lived at parchment and they still do they lived on the grounds they still do mm -hmm. and they still do and it even uh, i don't know that they've had controversy but their children have gone to the uh, to drew high school And the Drew school system. Now that's currently. That's where ours is. Yes, it was. <laughs> well, I, I didn't plan that. <laughs> <laughs> In that picture that Jill sent on the postcard, you know, the stripes, I had never noticed most of the stripes. Why? There were some of those guys they, in the band. The trust, you had the up and downs and the round and the round. And it, the trustees, and I have to look it up every time, and then the regular population. I want, I thank you for asking the question about the band. You read the histories, and they mention about the band being formed in the 1950s, and they did travel. And when David and I went on our junket parts from the band, played. You remember that? I don't remember. See there. <laughs> I paid more attention. Well, David's getting old. <laughs> we were on the same trip. <laughs> uh, nobody in any of the histories have mentioned that there was this band of sorts in the 1930s. Now, they were not, for instance, they had a very small chapel on the grounds for the civilian workers to go to church. And they didn't keep the inmates from going. But so far as actually having a designated place of worship for the prisoners, they did not. And you would occasionally have, they started having regular chaplain visits and services in the 1950s. So that band right there is not, not we don't, Lomax doesn't talk about that. That's nope, he's just interested in the music and the, the blues. In the blues. Mm -hmm. But we don't know whether they play blues or. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. have no idea. But, that seems to be one of the most popular pictures of it. And yeah, yeah, I'm hard pressed to believe that they just put that together because they have musical instruments. But I do think it's interesting that none of the histories mention anything <coughs> like that. Well, there again, so the history selected, and as I said, uh, one of these books is, and I would, I would recommend either one of these if you're interested in it. As a matter of fact, I recommend both of them. If you want to look more at the Jim Crow slavery vestiges at Parchman, this is the one to go with. If you're more interested in blues music, this one's probably the one to spend more time with. From the perspective of the infirmary, is your book going to have a, a view of what people were dying of at that time? You don't really know, but yeah, I do touch on that. And I have a feeling that encephalitis and related illnesses may well have been one of the 
things. I mean, they're in the Del Boom. They didn't have mosquito eradication. But they didn't have that many vaccinations. I've touched on some of the vaccinations that they had. You know, the, well, they did have some killings, but they evidently it wasn't the lynching type that a lot of reported. That one of the histories says, even though this is the common thing, they'll talk about these mysterious deaths and all that, that nobody's been able to actually substantiate that any of those took place. Now, is that intentional or otherwise? And you did have prisoners who killed each other. And that's what the trustees did if they started escaping. They had attack dogs. That's what, had, y'all may have seen the picture of what I coined as the parchment puppy. They had German shepherds and can't imagine these beagles, but obviously they did hunting too, but I think some of the hunting, they had that as game foods. Do they have a visitor center at Parkland anymore? I, I saw the mention of it, and I don't think they do. They, I saw a mention of one in that article on the folk art that they said something about a visitor center and some, well, and a state legislator wanted them to have uh, one of these interpretive museum sorts of things at Parchman, but I have not found any indication that they ever put that thing together. I went in to Parchman Tuesday because I knew they would have an archive of good stuff. And I got the camera back there that um, they have an administrative building that has uh, some photographs that are photocopied and uh, some cameras. That camera was used to take all the inmates' photographs from 1926 to 1993. And you see the first inmate photograph. And, uh, but they either don't know if they have anything or didn't want to tell me that what happened. Well, well, face it, at a certain time, we didn't care about stuff like that. The public didn't care and nobody else did, else cared about preserving history. I think we're more interested in it now. I wish they did have a visitor center. I'd be up there knocking on the door. They, they, they had one at one time. I know well, like I said. So far, I'm not sure that schools are going anymore. That used to be a routine trip. I had a chance to go at Christmas time with one of the church groups, and they told me not to wear rings or watches that they would steal them from me, and it kind of took my interest away of going over there. <laughs> A year. Had some, also have had some uh, electronic issues with this. Is what you know. Don't think you can just throw a book together with no trouble. Uh, the originals that I had were on with Dropbox. The publisher shortly after. We signed a contract would no longer allow you to use Dropbox. <laughs> and I had to get IT, the IT department at school, to help me transfer stuff well. And we won't get into the fact that my building is in the orange zone, which means we don't get as good a uh, computer service as they do somewhere. You think I'm worried about net neutrality when I live <laughs> with it on my campus. Uh, so I, but IT has come through for me, but it took them a while. And then I had to transfer some numbers 
and this is uh, with the way the company wanted them. Oh, well, now that, those would have probably been some visitors, so he may have come in and visited somebody there. John. Well, I always enjoy being with you people. You flatter my ego when it's <laughs> Thank you.